Good morning, everybody. It's a, another beautiful day. I say that every Sunday morning because we're alive. Uh, we have a very special message this morning brought to you by Vicar Josh. You're going to be in for a very big treat. And we would like you to stand with us as we worship our Lord this morning. And I'd just like to pray for us as we usher each other in. Heavenly Father, in this place, we take refuge from the world, from evil. We ask that you would restore us, that, uh, that you would just give us your strength this morning, that we would be able to put what happens outside and leave it out there for just even a moment and just uh, fill our cup, Lord. And so we lift our voices to you as the world tries to shut you out and silence you. And we ask you to be with us in Jesus' name.
take a moment, greet those around you, if you would, please. Just a couple announcements for your interest and in enlightenment. Next weekend, there are two events going on. One in the afternoon, we've had them here before. It's a terrific group of musicians, the American Legion Band. They have a wonderful selection of patriotic music, and it's so good and enlightening, they bring their own narrator to explain the history behind all of that. And the best part is free ice cream afterwards. So if I don't eat any all week, I can have some. Secondly, on a sad note, the vicar, Josh, and Mallory, and Emerson, their time at St. Paul's coming to a close. And I know, you know, I brought a tissue. It makes, makes me sad. <clears throat> We all know how much we're going to miss Mallory. <laughs> it's better than throwing one at me, I think. Seriously, they are leaving soon, and next Sunday morning we will have a little farewell with the usual Lutheran traditions of cake and coffee. So please come. If you don't have anything nice to say about Josh, come anyway and say something nice to Mallory. But all kidding aside, you know, we appreciate you. And it, just a preamble, if you don't have one of these, you'll need one for the sermon. We'll gather our offering. The question was raised as my conscience fell.
Let's take a moment and quiet our hearts as we go to the Lord in our prayers. Almighty God, we hear your word, we sing praise in song, and yet we still forget to realize how much you are present in our lives. Your Holy Spirit is with us each and every day. And we can't walk that path of righteousness. But thanks be to God, to your Heavenly Father. You walked that path for us. You took your life for ours. Remind us of that this day. You're with us always. And all we need to do is rely upon you. This morning we ask for your special blessing on Josh and Mallory and Emerson as they make their preparations for the next steps in their lives and the ministry that they have. We've been blessed by their presence here and we know that you will be a blessing to them and all the lives that they'll touch in the future. We pray for many, many years of ministry. And we pray that you continue to help us with our ministry here. Support those who are called to serve in our church and school. For all the staff that assist them. And for all of us that some way we can make a difference to be a shining light in our community. We have thanks for Jack and Lois Hammond who celebrate 60 years of wedding, wedded life. We pray for Don and for Beth and for Jerry as they recover from surgery and illness. Pray for the family and friends of Bill and Kitty and their recent deaths. And ask that you give comfort and guidance to Teresa, Ed, and Hannah, Margaret, Mary Jane, Karen, and Brenda. Bless those who are not here with us today because they may be homebound. And bless those who travel this summer, especially for our pastor and his family. All of these things we lay before the cross of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. This morning, we all realize that we're broken people. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. We have shortcomings, but we do have one great thing that permeates each one of us, and that's the saving grace and faith of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment and come before him, pause and think of what has happened this week, confess to our Lord, and ask for his forgiveness. assured by the words of our risen Savior that he has forgiven our sins he's made us new and as we experience in his own body and blood we're restored to him in perfect righteousness with that faith with that assurance we know our sins are forgiven amen
The Lord be with you. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took breath, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, this is my body, which is given for you. Please do in remembrance of me. The same way, also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take and eat. This is
This is my last sermon, and that stinks. Um, if you're a visitor, this is going to feel really weird because uh, half of this is just going to, you're going to be lost because honestly, half of this talk is just to reminisce a little bit and thank you. Um, and then the other half, I don't even know what you characterize it as, a devotion, a talk. It's going to be a lot of noise, and hopefully you'll catch some of it, right? So I don't know what we'd call the second half, but the first half, I just want to take you back in time. Um, the Concordia Seminary in St. Louis kind of has a way of doing things, and that is um, they like to get a sense of where you'd like to go for vicarage. And then once you share where you'd like to go to Vicarage, then they do everything they can to send you in the exact opposite direction and situation. So if you request California because, man, you just want to check out the beach and you grew up in Missouri or whatever your whole life, you're going to Alaska, okay? Or you want to go to New York, you're going to South Dakota. And this is funny to them. They enjoy it. They even make jokes. Oh, guess what? You're going to Alaska. Have a great life. So this is kind of what they do. Um, and so you know, the way that they share this information, if that doesn't make it bad enough, they do it in public. So you have no idea where you're going until they announce where you're going. And it's online, so people all over the country can watch it live in real time. It's, there's no delay so that they can edit out anybody's reaction. It's just there. Um, and then all the classes show up. There's even people that fly in, so it's a packed church for this whole ceremony. And so what Mallory and I were told is that we were either going to be in Long Island, New York, um, Colorado, I think it was Boulder, Colorado, or Minnesota. And he said, you know, so just think about one of those two, you know, one of those options. One of those three options is where you're going to end up. And we thought, wow, you know, Long, like New York, like that, that would be incredible. The big city. Wow. Never been there. It'd be great. Um, you know, Colorado here, it's beautiful. Can't wait to check that out. Minnesota, don't know anything about it. Why not? You know? And so um, I, there's two people in front of me when uh, the guy that is lying with they line us up and they, they tell you where you're going and they, they tell the guy like two guys in front of me that he's going to Illinois and my wife actually leans over to her girlfriend and says I would hate to go to Illinois <laughs> and so they say Joshua Duffy Northern Illinois District St. Paul Aurora and the thing is I tried to fake it like 
I tried to look really happy, but my mother was watching this in real time, and she saw my shoulders come forward, and she knew instantly, despite my best efforts, I was just confused. And, and really, we were just upset. I knew nothing about Aurora other than Wayne's World. Um, I, tried to, I tried to Google your, your, your church, your, the, what the town looked like. I knew nothing about it. Your, the website hadn't been updated yet, and honestly, that didn't do you any favors. So I'm just thinking, wow, like, what just happened to my life like this is going to be the longest year of my existence and, and I called my pastor back home and I said I'm going to Aurora I said it's like they said hey Josh you might get a new sedan a new sports car a new SUV and then in front of everybody they said well you get a new boat it's not that there's anything wrong with Aurora but you never mentioned Aurora you talked about all these other things and then in front of everybody you dropped this bomb on me and so I I call my pastor to talk me off the ledge and he tells me, he said, you know, Josh, before I went on Vicarage, I told the seminary, I'll go anywhere but Detroit, Michigan. He goes, where do you think they sent me? Detroit, Michigan. And he said, I hated the thought of having to go to Detroit, Michigan. He said, you know what? By that time that year was over, I was just, we were, my wife and I were in absolute tears. He said, because if you go on to ministry for 30, if you're blessed even 40 years, he goes, you will always have a special relationship with your vicarage church that you won't have with any other. And he goes, I grew more in that, uh, in that scenario, in that vicarage. That, in ch that church impacted me like no other, and I had the opportunity to impact them. And he said, so what you do is you stay humble. You be ready to serve. You be ready to learn. And just see what God's going to do because he has a perfect plan for you. So suck it up. That was basically the gist of it, right? <laughs> and so we came up here two months earlier before Vicarage would even start. And we got here and I happened to walk in on, on a Friday night and the doors were unlocked. That surprised me. And I walk in and it's something called Celebrate Recovery. And maybe you're not aware of that. It's an addiction ministry that happens here. And I met that we, uh, staff members that were here that were leading it. And I was just kind of taken off guard. I thought, wow, like a church here in the Midwest that is engaging real life problems and addictions here in their church. And then I, I'm walking over to this guy, this thin guy, and he's just playing guitar and he's reeling off all these chords and he's just having a conversation with me at the same time. That's always a good thing when you can meet a guitar player who can hold a conversation and play at the same time. He said, oh hi, I'm Jimmy. Uh, yeah, I'm going to start leading worship this year. And I went, Inside, I'm just going, wait, there's hope. There's hope here. Okay, this feels good. And so I walked out already thanking God that I started to get kind of this notion that this is where we were supposed to be. And so a little bit longer, I had my first sermon that, that, that came about. And I wasn't, I, I, I would reverse engineer sermons. And let me explain how what that means. You start out with a good idea. And then you attach Bible verses to it, and then you preach it the other way around so it sounds like you started with the Bible, when in fact you started with your good idea. That's how I used to preach. And so I knew that that had to, had to change because preaching then would only be limited to my good idea. And before you know it, you start sounding like a broken record because you run out of good ideas. You're just a person. That's silly when you have the Word of God. And so for the last two years, which have almost felt like prison at times, I'm just thinking about my past and what kind of a youth minister and what kind of preacher and teacher, and I wanted to change that and actually become a, a teacher of God's Word. And I knew before my first sermon, my first couple especially, that God was placing a very serious conviction on my heart to tell the truth. This is problematic when you're a people pleaser. And that's what I am. Maybe you can relate to that. I like to be liked. And for some reason, God's word wouldn't always place me in a position that would make me the most likable person. And so I finished a number of sermons standing back there thinking, uh, I am going to get slapped. Like, I, this is not going to go well. And I wouldn't even check my emails for 48 hours after every sermon because I just didn't want to know. You know, I didn't want some little jewel waiting there for me to say, hey, guess what we think of you. And so there were times I even wanted to just run out to my car, but I knew God doesn't care that I'm a vicar. So when I'm being asked to preach or teach, you better just step up and go, you know? And yet your responsiveness to me and the way that you encouraged me and built me up in that, you have no idea what that did for me. I got moved towards uh, Christmas Eve, and this is how this conversation went. Maybe you had the opportunity to experience that and be a part of it. Pastor Danny said, hey, do you want to be a part of, uh, you know, you want to preach like the 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve? I said, sure. And then I went and sat back down. 
Then I got back up and I said, hey, just quick thing. The four and the six are the same, virtually. If once you prep one sermon, what's repeating it? Can I preach the four and the six? He said, sure. So then I went and sat back down. And then I got back up and then I came back in. I said, well, actually, um, could I design the flow of the service? Sure. Then I went and sat back down, and then I came back in. I just started thinking, this is crazy. Something's come over this man. He's not thinking clearly. We're going to take this as far as we can take it. And so I went back in his office, and then I said, can I just change everything? Like the way that it looks, everything. Can I just, just for the heck of it, can I just do that, and let's just see what happens? He goes, sure. I was stunned. So I got out of there as soon as he said yes. We didn't want to give him a chance to change his mind. And so what I proceeded to do was engage different groups in this church. One being the sanctuary staff. One being the Monday morning ladies Bible study. Um, these were groups that in my stereotypical thinking, my thought, that these were groups that there was no way they were going to go for this. And I remember telling Mallory, this is not going to, somebody's going to blow this thing up. At some point, someone's got to stop me. They've got to stop me at some point. They, they can't just keep saying yes. And sure enough, I go in the sanctuary staff. You know, I don't know if you know about the sanctuary staff, or I don't know if you know the Monday morning Bible study. Wonderful ladies, but the, the, the median age is not like it's 23. I mean, would you agree? I mean, it's, we're up there, okay? And they were just like, we love it. Yeah, sounds great. And as soon as they said yes, I'm out the door, because that was, that's all I needed. 80-something volunteers, a lot of which are in this room, made that happen. I had a whole history of bad decisions in leadership and ways that I burned volunteers. And I kept thinking, are you going to burn these people again? Are you going to blow this event up again like you used to? Are you going to make these mistakes? Or are you going to try to do this differently? Problem is, even when you try to do something differently, maybe you can relate to this. It doesn't mean you know the outcome is going to be different. You're still moving forward in faith. And yet you and grace and your mercy and your love, you came alongside me and you made something incredible happen. We found out that we were pregnant and you know, for guys, we just throw thank you cards or whatever, gift cards on a table and we, we drink beer. That's how guys deal with you're gonna become a dad. Like that's how guys do it. We don't even open the cards. We just talk about, you know, whatever, right? We're just looking at sports half the time. Very few, very little dialogue. Guys tend to talk side to side. So we need something to look at and then we have all these meaningful conversations. Ladies, I don't know if you knew that. Ladies, let's engage for 45 minutes at a time, right? So when I walked in here, it was white tablecloth. These incredible, beautiful setup. You, you made my wife forget that she was 1,200 miles from home. I, I don't know if you can understand the weight of that statement, but that meant so much to my wife. She's not the social butterfly. I have that covered for both of us. It's hard for her to make friends. People think she has an attitude when she's just sitting there. And you went out of your way to love her and to shower her with kindness and gifts and you initiated relationship with her. I can't thank you enough for that. Um, I, need, I need you to understand that I, I will never be able to pay this back. And I hope you get that. There's nothing I can do to pay back what you've done for me this year. Um, all I can do is pay it forward. Um, all I can do is when the next young punk walks into my office and I've been doing this 30 years, hope that I have a congregation that's as loving as you people and do everything I can to make him succeed and to push him forward. And can I just tell you something real quick about your pastor? He never once, not once, did he ever try to hold me under his thumb. Like he has every, uh, he has all the power in the world to do that. Not once. I have some friends, I guarantee you, that can't wait to get back to St. Louis. He let me try. He even let me fail. And you know, any leader can talk to you about when they knocked home runs and when they were awesome and when they just killed it left and right and here, look how I did it. But not many leaders take you aside and say, let me tell you how I messed up as a dad. 
Let me tell you how my priorities got mixed up in ministry when I was younger. Josh, your, your little girl's crying because you just took her to the doctor and you got all this family drama. Just go home today. I just want you to know you have, an, you have a... I know we all are passionate and we hook it on in this room and I've come to love that about this church, by the way, but I want you to know you, you, have, a, you have a very unique individual that, that is your leader that serves you. And I want you to know that for what it's worth... I will, I will never forget this congregation. I'll never forget this church. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. So I have this uncle, Uncle Mike, he's, he's influenced me in music unlike anyone else. Has a freak of nature voice and talent. He, he can sing Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra, and then he can turn right around and sing Stevie Wonder, Otis Redding, Robert Plant. Just a weirdo vocally. And in the 80s, he would travel four to six months at a time going all over the country just trying to make it in the music business. And I asked him one time when I was a real little kid, I said, Uncle Mike, what do I have to do to become a drummer? And he said, well, and he, let me show you this. And he gave me a double CD of James Brown. You have to understand, I live like in the country, okay? And he's just like, here, James Brown, right? And he said, when you can play every song on here, then you're a drummer. Now, um, you just have to imagine how odd that is to having a kid blaring James Brown out in the sticks. But that became my sole influence and music has become such an, an outlet for me. And actually, by the way, I had my family divert their family vacation by like a hundred miles one time just so we could go by Augusta, Georgia, where James Brown was from so I could take a picture with his monument. I felt I was kind of indebted to his music. There's a weird thing. You know, when we're real little kids, we sing these songs about Jesus, and we accept Jesus, and we love Jesus without hesitation. His voice is so clear. There's no competition or distraction. We're told that Jesus loves us, and, and we believe that. You know, you watch a kid, how they sing, a real little kid, they don't sing on pitch, they don't sing on key, actually they're borderline screaming but they're not taking a poll of what does anyone think. You could march them up here in front of everyone and they're just shameless. There's something unique about when we're children. Jesus would say in Matthew 18, chapter 18 and chapter 19, that we need to be like little children if we want to enter the kingdom of God. He would even say, let the little children come to me. This simple, simple faith. There's a song from that era of our lives, of our phase of our lives that I think encompasses that childlike faith the best. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. If only it stayed that easy. If only if it stayed that clear. I don't know when it happens, and I don't know if you know when it happens, but there's a point in life where all of a sudden, you and I both, we start to look around and we start to notice differences. 
And this is what I mean. I don't, I don't know when exactly it happens, how old you are, maybe how old you were, maybe you can't even remember the moment, but it was the moment that you began to notice that someone else was thinner than you. Someone else was taller than you. Someone else was better at sports. Someone else did better in school than you. Someone was better looking. Someone else was the person that all the guys wanted, and someone else was someone that all the girls wanted. Someone else had the parents who treated them better than your parents. Someone else had more money. Someone else had more influence. Someone else appeared to be wanted. Someone else appeared to be noticed. And see, here's the thing about our sinful nature. Is the moment that that happens is the moment that distraction begins to enter into the equation. It's the first distraction. It's the moment that you notice that there's a difference in your world, that there's a discrepancy between you and the other people around you. There's a gap. There's a gap between who you are and who you wish you could be. We have to do something with this. We can still hear that Jesus loves us. We still pay attention to it. We still sing it, but for the first time, the words don't ring quite as true as they used to. There's something wrong. We can't even identify it or be sure what it is, but we know that there's something wrong. And so what ends up happening because of society, because of our culture, because of our peers, we gotta find identity and we gotta find acceptance. We gotta find love. And the way that we end up doing that with our sinful nature is eventually it takes on the form and the pounding, the constant pounding of jealousy, envy, greed, Lust, we'll do whatever we can to fill that void. But all of a sudden now, between the discrepancy and the sinful nature, for the first time, there's all kinds of distractions in our world. We start moving into our teenage years. And our high school years. And our college years. And what we decide, this is great and everything, this is wonderful, but this is a 2,000 year old message. So here's the thing about, see eventually we gotta figure out how we're going to fill that gap. And so we decide we're gonna fill that gap ourselves. Can I tell you something about sin? about rebellion. Sin is always the shiniest, brightest thing on the shelf. Always seems like the best idea. You'll never, ever have a shortage of people around you who can affirm your sinfulness and your rebellion. So that's what we start doing. We hit a phase in life, yeah, it's great, but I don't need it. Because let me tell you this, truth is, sin actually can sound pretty good. Sounds good. Sin, rebellion, sounds good. But then we start to grow up, see? We realize that won't last long. So the new game becomes, how do we make God our puppet? See, how do we make God work for me? How do we just get him to solve problems, you know? The, the Mr. Fix-It. How do we put him in that role? And so what we do is, we just say, you know, I'm gonna live my life, I got this, but God, please help me with my family. Otherwise, God, I know you can't do anything else, but please help me with my kids, right? You know, God, please help me with my marriage. 
You know, God, please help me with this part of my life. Oh, please. And even better, then we'll even throw in Christian things. You know, we'll, we'll do Christian stuff. Because that way, we feel owed. I'm a good person. I go to church, you know? God, I feel the, I feed the homeless, you know? Hey God, I went to confirmation. I don't remember anything. You know, God, I do good stuff. I go to church every Sunday. So certainly you're gonna hear my prayer and do it my way, right? Because I know better. Even say churchy words. Oh, praise you, praise you, Father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God bless you. Yeah, bless you, bless you, bless you, brother. Can you relate to this? Is this you? Just call on them. Not just call on them on the day of trouble. Not only in the day of trouble, right? Here's the thing about Satan. If Satan can't get you bad, he'll get you busy. If he can just make one day flow into the next, just drudgery. If he can steal the joy from your life and the moments that you could ever spend with God and seek his will and his desire for your life. If he could just make one day flow into the next, he's just gotta push the tempo, that's all. You know, and he's just got to make things move a little bit quicker, see? And he's just got to get you to a place where all of a sudden it's one day after another. It's one more fight. It's paying the bills. It's another argument with the wife and it's another argument with the husband. I got to go to work nine to five. Man, these kids, they would just do their homework. Another argument, another difficulty, more trials, more temptation, more struggles, more failure, more noise, right? More of the same, more of the same, more of the same. Stop! Sometimes we have to stop. He says, Jesus says, be, or God says, be still and know that I am God. That encompasses everything in this room. That encompasses all of our struggles and our trials and all of our stresses. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will bring you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, I have a hope and a future for you. I have a plan. See, the, the, the point of the gospel is not to make you a better person. If, if the point of the gospel is to make you a better person, what we should do is just shut this thing down and go to one of those Starbucks combination, Barnes and Nobles, get what they call a coffee with 5,000 calories in it, and then we just go over, mosey over to the self-help section, see? And we can just figure out how to be better people. The point of the gospel and the point of being here is not just to gather, it's not to listen to just some gimmick drum sermon. It's not to make you a better person, it's to make you a new creation. New heart, new desires, a new identity. And so amidst all of the pain, and all the heartache, and all the rebellion, and amidst all the noise that this world could offer and bring us, in the midst of all of it, there was one voice that cried out in all of it, heard among all the others. And it said very simply, 
Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. In the midst of struggle and trial and rebellion, he becomes our sin. He becomes our brokenness. He becomes our stress and our desire to be God. He takes all of that on himself for you and for me in an unprecedented act of grace and love that abounds for all time. And there was a moment when this was sealed for all time when he said, it is finished. Amen. like to take a moment for anybody who feels comfortable and who would like to come up and lay hands on Josh and, uh, and Mallory and, and Baby, if you're here as well. Definitely like you to come on down, brother. so grateful that you saw it fit for this man and his family to join us, even for a short time. We, we can't thank you so enough for all that they've done, and we give you thanks for the privilege of allowing us to do for them in your name. We ask your protection, your hedge of protection around each of them as they go away from us go back to where they call home and we ask you Father to sustain them to bless them to work through them until we meet again in the place where we all will call our eternal home we love you Father and we love the Duffies in Jesus name Sing with us as we end our time here this morning.